The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. From the secret government bunker where they keep the last working laser disc player, it's the Brandon Peters Show. Welcome back to the show. Today we'll be discussing the film Gross Point Blank with writer Aaron Neuer. But first, I'm not going to start every show with a, a thank you, but thank you everyone for the enthusiasm you've been showing for the show. I hope you enjoyed the first week and are ready for another one and see how things just kind of evolve. Let me know. Either way, I'm keen to hear your feedback. Email, comment, post, whatever. Just, you know, let me know what I'm doing or what I'm bad at. Either way, it's good. And now, let me welcome my guest. The guest for today has plenty of impressive credentials to introduce him with. A member of the Hollywood Critics Association. He's a contributor for Variety. He's a senior film and TV editor at We Live Entertainment. He's a writer for Why So Blue, and when a microphone is in front of him, he's the host of the podcast Out Now with Aaron and Abe. And despite speaking on pretty much a daily basis, I'm still honored and humbled to welcome Aaron Newworth as the second guest on The Brandon Peters Show. Hey, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy you've started your own show and you've done something that Abe and I have clearly modeled you for by including our names in the podcast. That's right. Like, <laughs> I got to take credit for it. I'm not big or anything like that. They got to know who's that guy. But I, I went with my last name both oh I, I i yes i mean that's great plus i look forward to when you amass a huge following much greater than ours you can have parody you know intros using like the full house theme or whatnot and having you like walk on the camera and be like and they give the put put the name on you get the regular guests there it'll we just go. be great it'll be fun it'll be good we're gonna do that it's gonna go i already have fan art someone made a fan art of me it's good <laughs> with my logo but yeah, we, we podcast all the time. So if people are listening that follow either of us, us coming together, maybe it's not special to them, but it's special to me, damn it. This is less like when the Jetsons met the Flintstones and more like when like Fonzie walked into the bar again and is right. like, hey. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not Fonzie, by the way. I'm not that cool. But that was the, it was the, I was thinking, I was shooting from the hip. That's the best one I can get. <laughs> there you go. Your playlist is still awesome. <laughs> We met during the James Bond phase when I was Mendelssohn's Memos. It kind of continues, I guess, this inadvertent narrative I have going starting in the previous episode, where Scott led me to the the writing and stuff, which I had a bucket list when I started writing those James Bond things. Like, I'd like to do a guest thing on a podcast. And you were like, but I, I think it was like the second article. You're like, hey, you want to come on my show? Yeah, I literally like <laughs> I reached out because I, I saw your articles on Scott's page and I'm a huge Bond fan among other things that I'm sure we'll get into. And just seeing that work being done and knowing Scott already, I was thinking, well, this is like, this is a fun avenue to go down as far as I want to get someone to talk about the upcoming Bond movie. And obviously we were like eight months away from that actually happening or whatever. So I was like, I'm going to reach out to Brandon and see what, see what he thinks. And yeah, we just started like getting into it. And then soon enough, we have like five commentary tracks recorded about Bond movies. Right. It was a start like, do you want to do another one? I was like, yeah. yeah like we did, we we did we from like... Rush with Love. And then we're like, <laughs> well, that was fun, but we didn't cover nearly uh, as much as we can. So it's like, let's do one from every Bond era. And we did it. And we still, we've still added a couple here and there. And ever since, I've only not been on one commentary since that. And it was... Mortal Kombat, and that I think tracks. you did a couple yeah, that was a, random that was a, specials. But. That was a crossover podcast episode. That's why Abe and I right. joined another podcast, and we did that together. So that's, yeah. We had no room for you. <laughs> but then I like I sit in my head. I'm like, have I been on Out Now with Aaron and Abe more, or have you done more Colts and McCavalcade episodes? I can't. Oh. <laughs> Out Now is going to win now. That, I mean, that was one of my primary goals when you guys started Colts <laughs> and McCavalcade. I was like, well, now we got to definitely keep doing the commentary tracks. Keep them on. Can't now. let keep this, this nonsense <laughs> go on. <laughs> and we're bringing the commentaries to the Brandon Peters show as a shared feed type thing just to get them out to more people because I think, I don't know if a lot of my listeners, I, they maybe see me sharing and stuff for them, but I want them to listen to them because they're just fantastic. We kind of have a core group now that goes at them, but we also have recurring 
people mm -hmm. that come in as well. And I think we got a lot of quality stuff that we record once a month for different films. Some Sometimes surprises, sometimes, oh yeah, well, let's get ready for this. Just to real quick, just to shout out, I will say I did enjoy coming on to Gold Cinema Cavalcade and, and talking with you. Oh, and yeah. Cullen, and you and Cullen. I, I don't want to like, make it seem <laughs> it like a fun show. I really wanted to tank your guys' podcast because right, Cullen's yeah, like no, listening, no. seething away, thinking, well, I'm going to start the Cullen Bricker show and it's going to have my guests. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be the not Aaron Newer show with Cullen Bricker. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun show. I, I enjoyed doing it myself. But the commentaries, I think at best you don't even watch the film with it because we don't, we pinpoint things. But sometimes the only time you realize we're watching the film is when some of us get a little quiet and be like, sorry, I'm just enjoying this. Yeah, it's and well, that's about well, when we do the best movies, it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. We have to keep talking. But for the most part, we're not Kevin Smith. We're not pointing out our friends on the screen all the time. So we have right. more things to talk about that just don't involve scene specific commentating. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a history of that film and people in it within the time the film plays. And sometimes a little longer after the credits. This is a great advertisement for our commentaries on Out and Out There in a Day, by the way. Yep. <laughs> so those will be a part of the feed uh, once a month. They'll hit in here as one of the oddball things on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And you had been doing Out Now when I came on and, and guessed in 2012, but you'd been doing it for what? A little over a year at that point. Prior to that, like, where does your history and criticism come from? Did you want to be a creative? Did you want to write a screenplay? Or because you going way back, you've been a huge Roger Ebert fan, mm -hmm. and uh, studying those guys from criticism. Where did your your genesis come from with that? It's never been a matter of me wanting to make my own movie. I'm not going to say I, I'm never going to have an idea, any ideas on purpose. But at the same time. <laughs> I'm not looking at myself thinking I have the screenplay. It's just dying to get out of me. That's just, that hasn't really been my thing. I appreciate others that act differently, but like I've never been one where it's like the, the end, the end goal of this is going to be my own movie. Never say never, but that's just not where my head's at with that. As far as where the film criticism came from around mid 2000, so whenever like I believe mission impossible three was maybe like the first full thing I wrote on Flickster. The old, the okay. old website, Flickster. I was on Flickster too. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so I, I wrote a thing there and I was like, well, that's fun. So I was doing that for a while because Flickster was convenient. Uh, it's since been, what, eaten up by Rotten Tomatoes. Now it really doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, all those little places got started slowly becoming one. Yeah. So that that eventually morphed into my personal blog, the thecodazeek.com, that I started up at pretty much the exact same time I met Brian White, the founder of Why So Blue, during Comic-Con. We were both sitting in a Spartacus blood and sand panel. We were sitting next to each other. <laughs> and, you know, me, I'm, I'm one that tends to just talk and I'm sitting next to you know someone that clearly wants to be in the same room I'm in. So why would we not want to like connect to some degree? So I'm sitting next to him. I think he was editing literally a review for Sylvester Stallone's lockout on Blu-ray. <laughs> while there. While, while awesome. we were waiting for the panel to start. So he was like doing like right. work on his computer while waiting and everything. So I was sitting there. We started talking and it amounted to, hey, give me your email and you know we'll, we'll go again so like eventually i emailed him and he's like yeah I can bring you on so i started writing reviews for why so blue so i started out with some film reviews i believe the first review i ever wrote was for rob reiner's flipped as well as the kids are all right which came out okay. around the same time and then scott pilgrim versus the world that was the big one i had lucked into getting tickets to go to the premiere for that film and so I was like really excited because I'm a huge Scott Pilgrim fan as far as the comics and everything, Edgar Wright. So all of that stuff really kind of coalesced into a, in addition to all the other stuff I've been doing, this is like a big deal. I'm going to a big movie premiere. I'm going to write a review about it. And Comic-Con was huge that year too, as far as Scott Pilgrim goes. So it was like a big Scott Pilgrim focus was going on as far as getting, putting me into a more professional world of, of film journalism. And then the, later that fall, when it was coming out on Blu-ray, I did like one of my first big interview things where I went to went to Hollywood and got to talk to Edgar Wright and Michael Sarah, Mary Elizabeth Winstead and Brian Lee O'Malley about the Blu-ray release. And then they had a screening of the film at the Egyptian. Thing. So it was like a big, everything Scott Pilgrim seemed to be like working towards me. <laughs> All coming up like, Scott like Doing like more of this stuff on a more professional level. I think my first press screening actually was um, Stephen Freer's Tamara Drew. That was like the first, like, I'm going to the Sony lot to see a movie uh, because right. I was invited. Those things all happen. So I'm writing for Why is the Blue now. So that's what's going on there. And as that was going on, that's 2010. That next March, my high school friend, Abraham Mua, Abe, he contacted me saying, hey, I'm seeing you're doing all this, uh, you know, reviewing and stuff. You ever want to like talk about a movie and you see what you can do with that, record it? At this point, Abe and I had both been listening to podcasts because that's what you do. Uh, and so a lot of that came down to I'm trying to find the right podcast I want to listen to as far as 
I want to be comfortable listening to people that know at least as much as I do about film. That's not me bragging about film. It's just more of I, right. I wanna, screaming at those hosts. I, wa- I, wa- like, I want to know that people that like movies as much as I do can confidently talk about it. So I like, you know, trying to find those podcasts. I found a few and I still listen to several, but I'm thinking, well, if these random people from whatever website are just randomly can do it. Surely Abraham and I can do a podcast. Mm-hmm. And then we recorded uh, our first episode for Battle LA starring Aaron Eckhart. It's <laughs> it's certainly a, uh, I mean, that's a movie and we certainly talked. Films have happened since then. We certainly talked about it. It's us talking, and that, and yeah, we we did our we did the job, and then a few weeks later, we kept, we I mean, we kept doing it. Our second episode, I believe, was Sucker Punch. I know Scream Four was one of our earliest episodes, and the first time Abe and I disagreed on something because I didn't like it, and Abe was wrong. We kept doing it. I, I you know slowly drew out the format and everything, and you know developed into an early version of the show. It evolved since then, or what have you. Kung Fu Panda 2 was the first time we had another guest on the show, Jordan Grout. Tree of Life was the first time we had like a whole panel of people on there. You know, it steadily evolved into what it is, which I'm very happy with. Abe and I have been, you know, doing this weekly for nine years now at this point. So it's even in a time like this year where there are no theatrical releases, we're still, you know, finding fun ways to do everything. And obviously, you know, we have other bonus things involved too, as far as commentaries and what have you. And so during that time, obviously, I'm still writing for Wise of Blue. I'm still getting, I'm gaining more access as far as getting help out from Brian and others to get into more screenings, meet more studio reps so I can be on the lists and things like that. And that's going great. I didn't necessarily look into it because I was, you know, I was writing, but I didn't necessarily, Mm -hmm. I didn't think like in 2010, five years later, I'd be able to comfortably walk onto the Fox lot on a, you know, on a regular basis to see movies. So it's like, this is cool. Like I'm happy to be doing this and what have you and form like, you know, different bonds of people as far as, you know, professional connections, what have you. And I managed Mm -hmm. to start writing for more, some more sites. I wrote for high def ninja for a spell doing blue reviews there, just based off the work I was doing, you know, for Brian at Wise the blue, Mm -hmm. I found a job for a year at rant, which was a website that was tried to be like an everything site. It had different channels like rant sports, kind of a lifestyle site where you have gotcha. all these different channels. Nothing, you know, as huge as Vanity Fair, something like that. But, like, but right. let's start as far as like having all the different kinds of topics you can get into. And so obviously Rant Hollywood was the main one I was writing for there. And that was like a paying like office job where I got to go and I had to write at least seven or 10 articles a day and everything. And it was taxing, but I was certainly like, okay, I'm getting paid to do the thing that I'm really, you know, enjoy doing and whatnot. So that was fine. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was a year. And then the company literally you know, fell apart. It was a, it was a startup and it just didn't pay off and what have you. After that, briefly got to do some writing for Screen Rant. I don't have any, I don't have any stories because I didn't like meet any of the people beyond just through emails, mm-hmm. but I was happy doing the stuff I was doing that didn't lean on the clickbait heavy things that I feel like they've right. leaned into more in the years since, which I think is a shame, but that's not that, you know, that's for them and whatever works for them is whatever for them, what have you. But, you know, got to do some cool things there. I got to go to the Academy one year for a screening of Heat, where Christopher Nolan was moderating the panel. It's on the Blu-ray, actually, with uh, De Niro, Pacino, and Kilmer, and all of them. They're all like there. So it's like, well, this is good. And then I wrote a piece on that. And I was like, okay, cool. That's fun. That ended. Mainly because I got the job for We Live Entertainment. That's why I met mm-hmm. Scott Menzel, who had contacted a bunch of critics about starting a new film society. At that point, it was called, it was going to be called the Los Angeles Online Film Critics Society. It's since changed to the Hollywood Critics Association. Emailed him about you know that signed you know, and I managed to get into the group. And at the same time, I, I did not know Scott Menzel at that point, so I I saw him at a screening. He's a very tall man. He has a very particular shape. So I was like, okay, I know I know who he is, so I can walk up to him. And we started talking, and I asked him initially about TV stuff. Failed to mention this. I do a lot of TV reviews also. Um, <laughs> I, I've been, uh, I, I was writing for the young folks for a while covering the walking dead and the Americans among other shows. I remember that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and in addition to all the stuff going on for the past 10 years, I've been writing about the walking dead mainly because I'm a huge fan of the comic. So I've been following it to the various mediums, whether it's video games or TV. So that's been another branch. And regardless of how much I like the walking dead as a TV show, I think it's fine. It has its ups and downs. I have been co-hosting another podcast, the walking dead TV podcast, since 2013 so that's been another like part of my entertainment media life so that being said because the young folks i'm like getting to be 30 and i'm not really a young folk anymore i was thinking i should mix this up as far as you know, moving on to <laughs> a different area my lovely girlfriend anna she was talking to me about that too it's like you're not really a young folk anymore it's like yeah it makes sense so like in talking to scott my initial thought was i can do some tv reviews for your site if you do because i checked out the site and clearly they didn't have too much tv stuff going on so i figured i can transfer yeah. over there 
And um, doing that, I eventually started doing written reviews also, partly because I was getting paid to do that. So right. it's like, I mean, I can do this here and not from the studios for good reviews, right? That's yeah, how. No, it... because Disney specifically. Yeah, just, just, yep. yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but no, I mean, I was like, I could do this here and not get paid, or I could do this here and get paid a little bit. It's never really about the money, but at the same time, it's like if I'm doing all this work, I might as well have some kind of compensation for it. Does it? I mean, it helps. It is, yeah, no, it be, keeps you going. I'd be doing the same thing regardless. So it's like whatever. So I started coming on Legal Entertainment, doing TV reviews there, and then I started writing movie reviews more there. And so that's been going on for a while now. And with between that and the Hollywood Critics Association, I've had a lot more access to earlier screenings, to screeners for award season, things like that, which has been very beneficial, very cool. Like I'm very you know, grateful to Scott for helping me and the many other people he has in that group out with all that because it's been you know, a really cool opportunity from stemming from, again, mm-hmm. I like writing about stuff on this random Flickster blog. So let's see where else this can go. And so that's continued to be pretty prosperous. Thank you, Flickster. Yeah, it's so... <laughs> We're going to pour one out. after, <laughs> And so now leading into this area, you know, I've done a, a lot of reviews all, you know, on a continual basis and everything writing for Wii entertainment. And in addition to that, between that and with, with why so blue, you know, I read everything that we do. Cause I like to just look at the sites and make sure they're going smoothly. So I, you know, I started mm-hmm. it just like the, the time at rant helped a lot too. Cause I had editors there for a change. And that taught me a lot. And so I started kind of just picking it up every now and then and just thinking, well, since I'm in the editor, I might as well look in some of the other, those other posts because I know they can use some cleaning up or what have you and started editing a little mm-hmm. bit more. So I edited some of the, like some of the posts you do and what have you on Why So Blue mm-hmm. and, and the things on We Have Entertainment, which, you know, Scott's been very happy with as far as his reviews and some of the other reviews out there. And so just fairly recently, he decided, well, hey, I'm going to, what if I promoted you up to have an official title as being the, you know, the senior editor of their website? So that's where that came from, which, you know, I'm very happy with as far as once again, there's a, great. there's a compensation aspect, which is, you know, cool based off of I'd be doing this anyway. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a neat tool to be utilizing as far as I'm an editor now. And that's and it's a skill that, yeah, I, yeah. that that's another skill I'm increasing. Like I'm a, I, I enjoy the writing process, which is why I like doing it beyond just, I get to watch movies. I do like writing. And so you evolve over time. So I, I, I know the writers I like that are a lot better than I am, but I, you know, I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job at it. It's, it seems to show. And so, you know, having the editing tool in my back pocket as well, that's fun also. That's a fun, you know, addition to kind of work on as well, as far as what I can do to enhance that ability. At around that same time, to wrap this all up, I was recommended to Variety, who were seeking freelancers to kind of do some work in their artisan section, which focuses on the below-the-line filmmakers, people like cinematographers and mm-hmm. production design artists and what have you. So that's where I was given that chance to start writing for Variety, which is what I've done in the past couple of months. So now I'm contributing there and doing the editing work for Weave Entertainment. So it's worked out fairly nicely as far as that's concerned, plus doing the podcast and all that. All right, you know, you're very deserving. It's been nice to watch you rise. It's like, you feel like you need to break into the Mendelssohn territory at some point. Jeez, the lucky guy. I mean, <laughs> we can't all be Scott Mendelssohn. We can't all get, nope. you know, a major director to attack us on Twitter and seek us followers after us. I mean, that's, you know, some of us are comfortable at our current station's lives. <laughs> a major director whom you praise more than most people do. Oh, it's been great. I, I like that through it all, the out now continues. Like it's it's tough to run a podcast and it's tough to run podcasts with two people, especially when you guys live in completely different cities. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen Abe in two years at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, and I think you know this, as long as it's fun, mm-hmm. there's no reason to stop doing it. Like that's the whole right. point of it. The, I mean, sure, you can have like minor inner arguments or what have you, but if you if we both we both enjoy doing this on a weekly basis for the years we've been doing it, mm-hmm. and there's no specific reason why we should stop doing it, it can keep going. And I mean, I'm I'm very right. happy with the way we have evolved the show to a you know particular formats and how we've adapted to this year specifically, and it's not stopped being a fun thing to do. So that's you know that's that's a huge part of why to keep doing this. I mean, I'm, we're going to talk about movies anyway. Might as well right. put it on you on on uh, iTunes or what have you to to force people to listen. <laughs> exactly, and it's created what I love to call the out now universe. Yeah, no, it's uh, the network of people. <laughs> it's very cool to have a you know a, a, a recurring stable of guests and various new guests on occasion, and kind of being, mm-hmm. incorporate them into this kind of bubble of people that all kind of know each other basically just through this. Like even if you've never met people like our, our friend Maxwell Haddad in real life or what have you. Right, it's it's fun that we're Jim Dietz. It's fun that we. Uh, 
are all connected in this weird way and that like Abe and I are responsible for that uh, specifically because it's a mm-hmm. it's in addition to you know being people that are big film fans it's a very diverse group of people which I'm very happy with as well. Mm-hmm. For all of us who couldn't wait to get out of high school. You look great. How long has it been? Since you stood me up on prom night. Comes the story of a man. What have you been doing with your life? Professional killer. Do you have to do postgraduate work for that? Who's looking for a second shot. Welcome home. I'm in love with you. I know we can make this relationship work. Gross point blank. You're a psycho. Don't rush to judgment on something like that. Ready to R. Starts Friday, April 11th at a theater near you. One of the early times in Out Now with Aaron and Abe, I was either listening to the show or I was on it in my early awareness uh-huh. of it. Y- you mentioned, in a jaw drop moment, that your favorite film of all time, or one of your favorite films of all time, is Gross Point Blank, <laughs> which we're talking about today. And I was like, oh, me too! <laughs> and I'd never met, I'd met people that liked it, but never held it to as high regard as you and I do with it. I was like, you know... Gross Point Plank is hitting one of those milestones this year. Let's do a commentary. And you're like, no. No. So I, I went. I started Cults of McCalvacate. I got five years podcasting a showdown under my belt and then started this show just so I could get you <laughs> to, talk to talk Gross Point Blank <laughs> on a podcast. So that's where we're coming with here. And Scott had a weird favorite, but this is a, like an actual favorite and of both you and I. And I want to talk about it. Shanghai Nights pales in comparison to 1997 bo- modest box office hit Gross right. Point Blank. <laughs> so, you're right. So this one, Gross Point Blank, 1997, directed by George Armitage, who uh, 70s exploitation and disappears for about 11 years, does Miami Blues, and then this seven years later. And so, then the big bounce, and then that's it. It's the only screenplay or f- like film or TV credit from Tom Jankowitz. But Steve Pink, DC DeVincentis, and obviously John Cusack touched this. It feels like it could have just been written by John Cusack uh, by himself. And of course, stars John Cusack, Minnie Driver, Dan Aykroyd, Alan Arkin, Hank Azaria, K. Todd Freeman, Mitch Ryan, Jeremy Piven, Joan Cusack, Michael Cudlitz, and Jenna Elfman. They did not realize how much gold they had in that cast at the time. <laughs> but it's a stat cast. My earliest memories, that I saw this on VHS. I didn't see it in the theater. It came out, I remember this and Private Parts had big, big pushes during the run of the Star Wars Special Edition films, especially during Return of the Jedi Special Edition. I kept seeing the trailers every time I went. I'd go see Star Wars a bunch, but I didn't branch out at the time, and I, I didn't have a car. It was an April release. Jedi was March, and both those movies were being pushed, and I didn't have a car at the time, and I just kind of went by, and then my parents rented it like the weekend it came out, and I just saw it sitting on the stack. I'm like, don't take that back yet. I want to see it. Fell in love with the movie. I had the poster in my room till I, I think it maybe gone to college with me. I'm not sure, but I, I had that damn poster. What was your experience with Gross Point Blank? Real quick, because I don't want to forget this, as far as like okay. it being my favorite movie offhand, it's when I rattle around, but I did, you know, I do. <laughs> it just sits up there in that top five. You know, among other people's like movies that they really like or what have you, there was one time on Rotten Tomatoes where they do that like favorite five movies with filmmakers or people. Mm-hmm. Neil Gaiman came on is like, and he listed Gross Point Blank of all things. And his, <laughs> and his explanation was literally, isn't it fun to just have a movie that people may not have heard of, but like it just seems like a cool option? That's why I'm thinking right. Gross Point Blank. It's like, okay, thanks, Neil Gaiman, who I'm <laughs> really fan, being a fan of. Um, right. That's awesome. <laughs> I don't think I saw this movie until a year after it was released. I mean, so the VHS probably came out, what, like six months later? was normal. At the Some, time. Somewhere in there, probably if in the not, fall, fall. If not more. Uh, so mm-hmm. I don't think I saw this until 1998. Weirdly, you know, you get those like double years where you have movies that come out that are similar and some you know volcano dante speak that kind of thing this was this was the year of high school reunions because he had the 80s the high school, high school yeah. reunion <laughs> right around it. two it was weeks like two, later like two weeks apart of it yeah, yeah. It was, wasn't far both class of 80 something reunions yeah. yeah and if i'm not mistaken i believe anaconda might have came out the same week as this movie did which i did see in theaters with my mother I didn't actively not choose to see Gross Point Blank. I just don't think I thought I saw the preview for it. Or if I did, I don't. I just don't remember it. But I, I stumbled across it a year later when the rental era, where mm-hmm. we could like walk around and be like, "Hey, there's a movie on a shelf. There's a poster. I don't know what this is. Let me read the box. This sounds interesting. Let me rent it. So, it's new. Cool." Yeah. <laughs> so that that process happened. Watched the movie, and you know, I'm younger 
and I have a VHS copy of something I've rented. So that means I've probably watched it multiple times because I'm like, mm-hmm. it's here. Might as well keep watching this thing. So I, I've probably watched the movie a bunch of times before, you know, I had to take it back. And I was just like into it, which is so weird because I'm not like I was born in the 80s. So it's not like I was a child of the 80s that could reflect on these nostalgic times or something like that. It was this mix of adolescence. Hey, Hitman, that's cool. There's a soundtrack that's pretty popping. That's great. John Cusack mm-hmm. has this attitude that I'm into. He's dressed kind of cool. Dan Aykroyd, like all these weird like, you know, just right, elements. Yeah. Uh, poo, like, just, like all these things <laughs> are like coalescing so into this like fun, like, you know, Hitman romp that has some interesting themes going on where I'm at a time where my mind's kind of shaping around like it is neat to see movies in a different way than just what's on screen. All of that just worked together to make me think I really like this a lot and I'm going to keep watching this whenever I get the chance to. That keeps going over time. The DVD comes out. I get the DVD. The Blu-ray comes <laughs> out. I review the Blu-ray reluctantly because it's hard to write about your favorite movies and be like, what else? Can no, I it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it is hard. And I, I thought it was gonna be hard going to this, but I can finally put to audio form my thoughts on it that I've had for so long as well. And this movie taught me a lot of things. Like it's, it's hit the, you mentioned the music, the soundtrack is outstanding and it showed me a different side of popular eighties music that I wasn't used to. A lot of like stuff that came out of like punk from the early 80s, the stuff that started becoming more poppy from it. And yeah, you, get the, you get the violent films, you get the specials. Uh, it's just good stuff. The Clash. The Clash, and, of course. Oh, man, there's so much stuff. Go, uh, you got to pick some pixies in there. Like it just, it has everything working for it. <laughs> it got two volumes. It's that yeah. good of a soundtrack. Yeah. It got two volumes. And I I had I had multiple copies. Like I, I wound up losing my CD once and I got it again. And then I found the other one. So I had two copies of it. And I, this thing still is in rotation. Like I still listen to this. It's become to a point where I associate these songs with this movie when I hear them. Yeah. Not because of the the movie. Like they fit the movie so well. There's like little weird one liners and stuff. Towards the end, when Debbie finds him in the hall after he kills the hitman. And the ninety nine lift balloons. After him, right, so. ninety nine lift balloons, an anti war protest song mm-hmm. plays. Like that's just there's, I mean, just brilliance there. And it goes with the eighties dance and oh. Before then is that that mirror in the bathroom drop, which is juxtaposed right. with the dancing on the on the floor for the reunion and John Cusack beating the hell out of the uh, the kickboxer who trained him. What's his, yes. what's his name? I can't remember. Ben, yeah. It's like your Greek Guinness or something like that. Oh, I know him. He's an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that line. The way there's such a there's a weird because I I read that they they did this movie with like three different there's could be three different versions of the movie there's like a straight scripted movie a little mildly understated version and then an over the top and I guess they mostly went with the over the top stuff yeah but there's a sense of normalcy to this movie that's just off the charts like it feels natural this feels like people real people having just real interactions and stuff it it just it's crazy to think that all of it's over the top, but it's a big. It works. It's a big part of what I, you know, I think that appeal is. Where yeah, if you have a a hitman comes back for his high school reunion, that's a that's a high concept and it's kind of zany. But mm-hmm. the way Cusack approaches the role, and I think he's pretty excellent here. Um, this is his best. This is my pick for his best. I mean, like, by default, just because it's my favorite movie. Like, right. It's like why would? Well, yeah. But it's right. But like the way he kind of rolls into town and just. You know, it's not like he's not hiding anything really beyond like showing off this mm-hmm. kind of paranoid side to him. He's not telling people outright that he this is what he does, but he's not hiding it either. Like he he does say it literally to people and they just don't believe him. But he kind of tosses it out right. there as like, yeah, I'm a contract killer. Like it just kind of rolls out. And yes, he, that tone, it's it's really well handled. It's really well balanced because it is occasionally very funny, whether it's because of Jeremy Piven outbursts or some mm-hmm. over the top physical stuff. But there's still this kind of sly sense of it's less about the fact that I do this crazy thing and more about the I'm just an oddball that's come back into the world here. And I'm going to present that as awkwardly as I need to. But I still want to like get across like I have a mission here. I want to meet, meet my right. former girlfriend again. I want to see my mother. I want to see where I grew up. I want to like he has. The, I mean, as the movie goes, he has this kind of epiphany that i know is in the script but is unseen in the movie he's got to describes it later on where he has an epiphany as far as what he's doing just doesn't work for him anymore like, well and he has a realization that oh everybody's effed up yeah. not just me like because they do a good job of showing how normal he comes across to us compared to the other people he's running yeah. into and how together and he's actually got something because he's very fine with how he present he does things and very business but he's got a maturity and a 
level that's well, he's, way different he's the than that left town, into. right everyone else stayed in right, Gross yeah, Point. yeah that's, that's true the thing that crystallizes during the reunion when he's staring at the baby and under pressure's playing on the on the screen and everything like it that's a great moment that mo- oh that's one of the best uses of that song it's a huge moment that baby staring and the people in the streets like yeah every everything oh, that's going on so in his good. head as far as him being there it, it just arrives at that moment he's like okay i get it now i don't want to do this this is done this is not my thing anymore mm-hmm. like that's what he's dealing with throughout this movie and it's like that stuff that's you know even if it's not outright said it's layered in throughout you're watching this happen you're seeing this performance and you yeah. and you have like you know these fun characters you're interacting with whether it's dan Aykroyd as rival hitman or Tay Todd Freeman and Hank Azaria as the other NSA agents, right? Yeah, there's some yeah, Security, there's government people hired. Yeah. You know, the other, you know, various friends, Jeremy Piven, what have you. And then, of course, Minnie Driver, mm-hmm. who's the biggest part of that puzzle. And, and right. like, you know, she has a very specific kind of attitude as well because he left her right there. So, so right, she, yeah. she's less detached than everyone else from whatever he's been up to because she's very curious as to what it is that caused the person that you know, that she loved to go away from her on that night. She's curious and reserved. Like it's, it's a good, it's a good hand. So you have all these things Not going on and like, there's a way to make that feel sitcom but it doesn't, it just, it feels like it registers no. on a better level. We can look hindsight now, but this was, this was doing John Wick before John yeah, Wick. There's like agree. this huge underworld of hitmen with different personalities, a code. And you know, Dan Aykroyd's hitman is a rival guy, but he's wanted to form a union he wants to unionize. <laughs> they have discussions about that. They meet in a diner. Whenever they meet up, there's a certain thing both of both of them are doing. They both worried that they're going to kill one another. Right, yeah. So. Man, I could sit and watch those two have exchanges for days. It's really... They're very enjoyable. It's one of Aykroyd's best as well, too, especially yeah. post, you know, post-late you know, 80s. This is definitely some of his best work. It combines what he can do well, where mm-hmm. he can be this fast-talking huckster type of character, as well as have this kind of sinister edge to him. And I'm sorry, nothing but trouble, but this is the better version of that. So, <laughs> right, and he's not—he has no problem being the butt of a joke. There's the yeah. great bathroom scene where Martin Blank was, and I always use this whenever I see someone in the bathroom. I always go, yeah. "Oh hi!" Like if I know them, I just from that movie. Nobody else probably knows what I'm doing, but I always go to that. And then the the guys when they're looking out the into the hall, they're like, "Oh, he's coming back!" And Ackroyd goes in. He's like, "Oh damn it, you guys." It's that silent exchange, too, when Hank Azaria goes, he's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's, I mean, everybody in it isn't over the top hilarious, but they are killing it in the comedy field. I mean, Mini Driver's got funny stuff that his area, Hank Azaria, I mean, everybody. Kippen's very funny in this movie. Like, yeah. he, he, he does his job. I mean, even Mitch Ryan is just subtly hilarious. Oh, Mitch Ryan there. gets some great dry lines. Yeah. What, what is it? I'm a contract killer. Oh, growth industry. Growth industry yeah. <laughs> you have my blessing. Yeah, he's he's hilarious too. It's it's just a killing at all levels. And I mean, there's even cool like the action. I was going to say this is a very cool movie. That's the other thing I think I really responded to. It's it has a you know comedic tone, but it's fitting in that post Pulp Fiction era of yeah, we're doing crime stuff, but we can make it cool to watch as well as mm-hmm. kind of humorous. And I think this one. I mean, it's not trying to do the same things that Pulp Fiction does, but it's certainly exploring that kind of area as far as... I mean, it's better. Yeah, it, they, they shoot Pulp Fiction in this. To... Yeah, <laughs> they, they take it on. Armitage, I think, does some really cool stuff with the action sequence, and even just with the assassination stuff. I mean, early on, you have the opening hit that goes wrong, but it's like, it's more wacky. But the well, second one in Miami, which is a whole, uh, what, you, you Only Live Twice You Only reference. Live Twice, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I didn't realize until years later, obviously. Right. Because, uh, I, I, I mean, I like Bond, but I was like, I can't specifically place these two things. And I'm like, oh, I see what we're doing. It's a high-tech uh, version of it, yeah. But it's a very cool, like, the score is really cool and everything. He's, he's, it's very, it's shot, it's shot like probably the most, thriller like throughout this movie as well, far as what he's trying to do and like what mm-hmm. ends up happening and the way cusack moves down the stairwell is like that's how i feel like i would be moving down like because he's not clean he's not slick he's not being quiet and fast he's hauling butt down there and just burrowing through there so he's kind of got a well he's got a slim figure he's kind of got a bully brutish side to him which is you know the bond like thing well i mean that shows in all of the violence he puts out mm-hmm. there right i mean there's there's that there's obviously the kickboxing fight which is a stun another right. stunning sequence as far as action goes and even later on when when it when you're more in driver's perspective watching him do the thing he does as he's killing all of grocer's men and yeah. Aykroyd's men and he, he not only like shoots one an assassin multiple times he takes a frying pan and knocks him over the head with it. it's like this guy yeah. needs to be he knows how to be brutal when he has to it's a mode like he is yeah like i don't have many like issues with this movie i could pick it apart if i really wanted to but mm-hmm. why i really enjoy this movie 
I would like to see more of like that edge kind of climb through to see it become more of a dark comedy. I do think there's yeah. more areas to explore there, which yeah. is what we, I guess we could have presumably got in the unofficial sequel war Inc, but that movie's it's not great. No, <laughs> uh, I, I do want to point out, you mentioned the opening, I think just so visually awesome, it clearly establishing everything this movie's going to be within like a minute where you have Martin blank being the sniper from above, you know, his little prison is doing his, the contact the solution stuff. He mm-hmm. he completes his task, and then here comes Dan Aykroyd sloppily coming in, just finishing off the job he was supposed to prevent. And you clearly establish these two. You clearly establish how they do things, the stakes, and what the headbutting is going to be. While Joan Cusack's on the phone telling him about his ten year reunion, like that's the whole movie right there. And it's just, I think maybe this time around, or maybe a couple times ago, I just like realized, like, man, this is just a brilliant setup right from the bat. And oh, the yeah. song, and the song, I can see clearly. Now. I can see clearly now. Just what a, I mean, what an open. Like, yeah, I mean, and you and you you establish all those main players right up front. You get mm-hmm. you have you have him in Cusack, you have him in Ackroyd, and you have him in Alan Arkin doing a day of work to make the three scenes that he has works really well. Mm-hmm. So. Which I was, I think, it, it's less to me now the psychiatrist scene, which psychiatrists were a big '90s thing with movies. That was like a big point of this movie when it came out, and now I'm like, I watch those scenes and I'm like. Okay, they're they're still funny. I mean, you see, analyze this, follow this movie, and, and the Sopranos, like Sopranos, and analyze this is where it peaks. Yeah, as far as like, see, they're like us. They need help too. Right, and I think it starts kind of here, and it kind of comes off of that with the the hitman or you know, well, you, dark you make character. They make the subtext more text as far as it's not just right. it's not just you know Vince and Jules going over the you know existential existence that they exist in it's i didn't mean to say it mm-hmm. that way but that's how it came out now it becomes well now let's just actually sit them on the couch and have them really delve into their feelings <laughs> right yeah yeah that's true they yeah the action sequences you get the one in the where his home used to be at the gas station which is a huge expl- i mean massive explosion there the, fun, um, the best when they first introduced that convenience store and you have guns and roses live and let die playing another right another yeah reference right the, be- the best is when he, he walks into the store and the music version of the song yes. starts playing <laughs> like that's just that's just like a fun little touch and they also have a doom 2 arcade machine just, which never yeah, existed just for that movie Never yeah. existed. I knew that when I saw the movie. I'm like, wait, that is not. I I, I want to know who has that prop. It's probably worth a fortune. <laughs> right. Hope they didn't. Yeah, blow it up. And the the guy who works there is hilarious yeah, too. The, He's like a little. Not Steve Zahn. <laughs> not see. Yeah. That's, that, that's perfect. That's not Steve Zahn. He's like, how are you doing? He's like, he's like, oh, I'm not good. I have to go find another job. It, it seems like um, Batman Forever when they wanted Wayne Knight. And they couldn't get Wayne. Right. So it's like, I guess we'll get this guy. Instead, it feels like they wanted Steve Zahn. It's like he's busy. All right, <laughs> what's what do we got? What? Who's, where's a blonde yes. surfer guy that would convincingly work in Detroit or Gross Point, Michigan, <laughs> to play this role? I, I jump not- back with that action sequence in the convenience store. Yes, it's a, it's a cool action scene, and it's got. I mean, again, it's set in the convenience store. It's zany, but it's still. I mean, there's two guys hurling bullets at each other, but you got La Poubelle. That's his name. You have you have him setting mm-hmm. up a potato bomb or a C4 bomb in the in the microwave. You have John Cusack sliding on his knees with two guns in his hands. Like it's like there's some cool stuff in this movie. Well, it's surprising. I'm like, man, Armitage is showing us like he could put a great action scene anywhere. I'm surprised he doesn't work much because the end, the finale, is outstanding. Like it is perfect. They mess around a lot with kind of video game stuff reminded me of like that. Remember, I think it was, was it Time Crisis or Virtual Cop where you Time had cri- the pedal yeah, at yeah. the arcade and you like go down to reload and look up and you'd see guys coming at you. And that's what it looked mm. like when you see the yard shots of Dan Aykroyd running up and just a lot of good edits and geography. I mean, just- even... You know Even where everything's before going. Before that, on? you have the reunion fight with, with Poobel again, where it's that where it's just right. martial arts, and that's probably the most thrilling element of the movie because it's it's real it's real like down to the bone. One of these guys is going to kill each other, and they're only going to use each other's hands or what have you. They're not using guns. At right. Point. I had to tie this back in too. I forgot about to mention this. Obviously, we mentioned War Inc. already as a kind of spiritual sequel, which I believe because they wrote they mm-hmm. have a draft for two. They wrote one. There it was for a long time. He wanted to do something to follow this up, and it leadership be- fell apart and whatnot. So like that didn't happen. But like that's basically mm-hmm. what the a lot of the elements of War Inc. are com- coming from that draft is what I I'm at, I believe right. is confirmed. That. I'm not just making it up. But before that, unofficially, it's re- even more unofficially. It's really fun to think of this as a sequel to say anything. I mean, that's that's the other thing. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> this is, I was thinking about this. This is like his, you know how Eastwood does Gran Torino is like 
it's not Dirty Harry. It's not his it Western might as characters, well but kind of be. this is might as well be the retirement of them. This is kind of like his '80s, you know, better off dead. Sixteen Candles, say anything. Characters, what happened to them after? And yeah, no, specifically that's, Lloyd Dobler, because the guy. I mean, the guy was. Yeah, Lloyd the guy was kickboxer, a kickboxer. Yeah, he had a very eccentric personality that kind of matches what he's doing here. I mean, John Cusack. You know his cassette tape. It's weird, was that, it's weird that John Cusack yeah. is more rangy now, even if the movies aren't or the performances aren't that great. But like then he has a pretty particular mm-hmm. type that he's playing up until what, like two right. thousands, <laughs> even like identity. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. It's like before that, he's you know, he's playing the John Cusack role, right? It's a, it's a you get to this one, right. and, you're, and you're looking at it, you're like yeah, things were different if you change the way say anything played out it's speaking of, like i can't imagine anyone other than cusack just feels like his movie even though it came from someone else's script but like apparently Kiefer sutherland had interest and i'm like i don't you don't get the same movie with he's that not, like he's not all. inherently like, this is, funny that's the thing like there's not a, there's not a humor there. no no i'm not saying cusack's you know a big stand-up nope. but like you can read the dry expressions off his face and find that to be humorous Kiefer, you just think he wants to punch you if you're right. acting in the same way he does. Yeah, and he was he was in in the '90s. He was in weird roles and evil, like more evil. Like Twenty Four was a real refresher for him, and and this would just not. It wouldn't be the same movie. And there's no way you could pull off the comedy as well. But yeah, tapping tapping into that. Yeah, the, the kickboxing thing and what have you, and yep. even like the guy he fights is the guy that actually trained him to be a kickboxer. It's a really intense fight, and it looks great. And you have Mir in the bathroom playing in the background, and you mm-hmm. yeah, you have the pen moment and everything, and it's really brutal. And you yeah. see like the camera's locked in on his face as he's doing it. It's really close up and intense. So you get you get a, another you know sense of look how brutal this is. Look at the life that he's really not into. Ba- this is after the baby moment too. Like he's done that already. So he's already yeah the disgust that he has there is like, I really don't want to be doing this now. And you're poor, you're forcing my hand in the middle of this whole thing. And then, yeah, it flips the tables as far as Debbie goes. I think his, his thought is like, okay, this one kill him. And tomorrow we start a new, we leave and then he gets caught. And then that just throws everything out the window. And I think that's, he's like, all right. So you got like, you wanted me to talk about this movie. Now I just think about like unique bits in this thing. Like there's a shot because you talk about George Armitage and how well he is at directing action. Like it's a wide shot and, Q- and Cusack like does a straight kick to him and it just knocks him against the locker room. It's like, yes, where is that in movies now? Like, I don't see that. You see, you see the, you know, the lead right. up to it. You don't see the impact nearly as much in these things. Thank God for John Wick and other movies that are, you know, bringing the raid among other things that are bringing right. these things back. But it's like, make like, it hurt <laughs> that that pain <laughs> registers. I me- I remember that. I can't remember the exact beats of the CG battles that I see on screen or what have you. I'm not against them, but it's like, I'm talking about my favorite movie of all time based off single shots versus movies I'm very entertained by that. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. They had a lot of stuff. We got away from showing everything. I think it became a little easier to cheaper, less set up to shake the camera and make the audience simulate feeling it. And people got tired of that a lot quicker than just having some nice choreography and having to ta- do a take where a guy mm-hmm. jump kicks a guy in the chest like eight times before you get it. Like to, like to jump out of that real quick, you go like John Wick. There's a shot in the first one where he sees Alfie Allen and he know, like this is the guy he wants to kill and he's already has a guy like in a in like a lock and he, he sees him he sees him locking eyes so he looks at him and nails the guy just to show this is what I'm gonna yeah. do and it's like that's the impact <laughs> that's the impact that I want to see more in these kind of movies there we go yeah exactly not because I champion violence of course just because I find it entertaining at a cinematic level <laughs> that's why returning this is like refreshing after what you know we have I think we're we're getting better actions on a good turn right now but there was oh, there a lot sure. of action genre in general is doing some we went things. through an ugly phase there from like the mid to late oos through <laughs> everybody wanted to be green the yeah they wanted to be green and you and he does what he does well but not everybody can yeah, do that's it that's the difference not everybody yeah. can do it his stuff's great even jason Bourne, the yeah but the fifth one i want to say fourth but we can't forget the chems but even that i mean as as much as it's just kind of ho hum it's still light years better than the people trying to imitate him a lot of the time you're at you want to know why this is my favorite movie <laughs> it just works it, no, <laughs> like, i think it's thing. perfect it's i like, really do i wouldn't not, change a thing i think it all it's works. not rooted in nostalgia it's like I, I mean you could say it's rooted in nostalgia to some degree but it's not like I haven't evolved as far as my movie tastes go. There are movies that I used to really enjoy that I think are, you know, not great now, or just like I can casually watch them or don't even want to watch them because like I know that the flaws are there and I'm just not going to enjoy it nearly as much. This one holds to me. This will like nothing about like, it. if anything, it's only increased in my, in my, you know, uh, enjoyment of it over time, just because I can recognize a lot of the themes now more than I, because I'm older than I was and see like a, a person that's gone, like I've gone to my 10 year high school reunion. See, point, I did. This, so it's like, this movie made me like, oh, I wonder what that's going to be like. And then mm-hmm. when my 10th came up and I was like, 
I am okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's <laughs> sorry, gross point blank. Uh, uh, Brandon, nineteen ninety seven, gross point blank watcher. I failed you. So there's the thing. So yes, I I you know watch it as it's gone on. The thing I do now with this movie, the thing, the reason I didn't have to prepare for this podcast to watch is because I watch it every year on my birthday. It okay, the, it, it is the one movie that I definitely watch every single year, specifically on my birthday, or at least around it in some capacity. Generally on the day, though. I mean, I've seen it enough where I, if I'm busy, I could have it on and not really sink right into it. That's that's rarely happened. It's become this thing of like I'm just going to enjoy watching this because it's the movie that I watch. I know when I'm going to watch it. I don't have to be. Like, it gives oh, you everything. It, it really does. I mean, comedy, action, drama, a little bit of philosophy stuff. I mean, it's it's there. I mean, some horror. I mean, his blood. It, they. Pale up Cusack when he kills the guy with the pen. Yeah, quite a bit. Just a horror. It's a cold but, sweat. Yeah, yeah. It's everything. It, it so gives it you just, everything. It has. Yeah, it has it all. It's entertaining. It's not, you know, it's pretty breezy. It's only a hundred and something minutes. Like it's not you know super oh, yeah. long and it flies by. I mean, but yeah, it's at the point where my lovely girlfriend Anna she threw me a birthday party themed around Gross Point Blank a couple of years ago. We're okay. like dressed up as the character. We did. A, we have a shot of us like the movie poster. We watched the movie. We had an '80s soundtrack on shuffle. Like mm-hmm. playing, you know that specifically fits the vibe of that movie had you know food and everything so it was super cool that you threw that anyway, so it's like i i've had do everything guys, i can as far do, as gross do you have to sit goes. do you get into character and like sit away from windows turn the blinds kind of like <laughs> change microphones from recording i mean the truth's out there brandon to quote the x-files <laughs> obviously so you know i'm always doing that regardless i mean that's just the right. thing that makes sense to be talking <laughs> I forgot. We've been talking about other movies that r- remind us. Uh, he was hiding his stuff in vents in the hotel, just like it reminded me of No Country for Old Men. I was like, oh, okay, that was here. That's just one of those tricks of the trade that they you know, true, study yeah. up for. Yeah, I'm sure Eddie Bunker taught them that or something. <laughs> true, true. Those big old vents in the hotels. But we have a roster of side characters that really help fill out. And I think they help make this as well. And they don't... Ab- they don't overdo or abuse any of them or have any of them go like way over the top. You know, Piven, obviously, which they're real high school friends, mm-hmm. John Cusack and Jeremy Piven, and he's a realtor. And he just like, he doesn't let him know. He, he finds him out in town. Like there's this little town square. It's a small town. So I guess you could find people walking around and takes him around. And I love one of my favorite parts is when he drives up to Debbie's house, Cusack's old flame. And he's like, Debbie's house. And he's like, kind of crept up on you. He's like, you drove us here. <laughs> and I, was, I always, I always crack up. His reaction on is, that. yep, um, I did. And then they drive off. <laughs> yeah, they drive up. Yep. Yep. I did. And he, him at the dance, like coked up and trying to go after Jenny. <laughs> it was a Jenny Slater. Slater. Yeah. Hey, Jenny Slater. <laughs> hey. Like he's all fun and games with Martin, letting him go, and then when the shit goes down, he is he's sober right to yeah. change and like what? he's even concerned for and Debbie it, when she's coming down crying. She's mm-hmm. like, "Where's our boy? What's happened? Like, what's going on? Did he hurt you?" Like he has this like concern yeah. in him, so it's like he's he's the friend of this like group here. Like he's he's like true right. Friend. I forgot to check this time when I watched it, but I saw a thing where every person he actually tells that he's a killer to discovers he is in the movie, and people he doesn't, they don't find out. But Debbie. Piven, uh, Debbie's dad, and yeah, they all they all find out, and those are the only people. But maybe he tells that teacher they meets at the beginning. No, I mean, does he so, have or, a line? What does he? Or no, he's going to, and she says he, his tie looks nice before he can yeah. do it, and then he's like, "Gonna go visit my home, are you?" <laughs> or something like that. Which that's a pretty fun scene. I, I like that scene with him and the teacher. I, I, She's a side character that maybe it's goes overlooked you, you get a lot you get a lot of just great backstory and exposition just through the kind of montage you get there with like that yeah when he i mean obviously when he goes to his mom but that's not that's just that's direct dialogue but when he goes to visit his dad at his gravesite and he just pours a bottle on it mm-hmm. everything you need to know right there <laughs> right yeah it's great the, at the dance or the dance the reunion we it's get a like a, <laughs> yeah, it's a dance. Uh, we got like Jenna Elfman in a like Joan Cusack sixteen candles tribute. Yeah, <laughs> with her. Yeah. And she's really fun. And this, I guess, is the screen debut of Jenna Elfman. <laughs> and then her and Mitch Ryan would get Dharma and Greg. Yeah, really I'm sure they bonded on this. set, and they're like, "I have this idea for a sitcom." <laughs> like, wait, you? I'm reading for this too. Or <laughs> you're Greg? <laughs> you're, oh, you're, oh, this ain't gonna work. Thorn cult <laughs> abilities, but Michael Cudlitz kills. He is. Amazing, and he still looks this age. Yeah, my so. brother was doing well for himself. Oof, uh, oh my gosh, this is Key Cudlitz character actor time here with this, and like the negotiator the next year and things like that. Like he's all over the place, but yeah, here he's he's a he's a force. He comes in, Bobby Beamer, <laughs> like, right. more coked up than uh, than Jeremy Piven, <laughs> and, uh, and just wait, like you know, he's not going to remember the night, and you know who he was in oh, high yeah. school, and still is. So 
this like was inspiring to me when I watched it as a kid. I was a kid who got bullied a bit in high school. I made fun of. I I made movies. Yeah, my beard in high school. I made movies. I did weird things that like other kids weren't. It was like sports, sports, sports. You use your camcorder to make movies. How weird. Oh, and you're in drama. But and he's a stereotype and he fits it. But I'm like, wow. They meet in the hall uh, alone. And he's like trying to pick a fight with him. And John Cusack gives like the most amazing speech where he's like, do you think there's an us? Like there's like, there is no, uh, there, he's like, you and me, whatever you think, you and me, we don't exist. And that was just like, I'm like, that makes sense. That's what the problem is with these people. There is no conflict and these people just want it. And he does that. And then Cutlets cowers down. He's like, you want to do some blow? He's like, no, no, you don't. he brings out the poem. Pulls out a poem that he's written that's in it, that, that's readily accessible. Readily accessible. <laughs> and he's like, when I, he's like, skip, skip a few to the end. It's like, for a while. For a while. <laughs> Wait. I, w- I wouldn't sell the dealership, but. Uh... <laughs> it's almost like it reverses and Cusack gets to be the bully finally to him. Like he's now in the, the driver's seat of, eh, eh, you and your stupid I mean, stuff. I would but, call the uh, just be more like, He's in control, yes, and it's also I have no time for whatever this is that you're going through. I have my own things to deal with, so let's wrap this up. <laughs> right, true. And then they later show him on the dance floor, just going like nuts, and he, I think he falls down. It's whole, it's just perfect timing. And uh, and Debbie sees the whole thing, and she's like, okay, yeah, he's he's probably not killing people on the side, so I could probably get this. Right. Then we got, but the guy with the wrestlers. That's pretty funny. Like, like what? Is, okay. Oh, he's <laughs> that's one of the screenwriters. The security guy. He's one of the. That's writers. Pink. Pink's the security that's guy. That's Pink. Okay. That's, that's and right. he gets two called. scenes. Yeah. He gets one at the house where at, yeah it bothers the people at Piven's showing, and then he brings the gun to the reunion. Tracy, which is the normal, the one that's sort of there, like you could tell they had a special kind of relationship when he was in high school, and then seeing that she's done well and all the stuff he fears isn't so bad that she confirms. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's one of the few times in a movie that. Someone's like a little bit honest about parenting or like stuff doesn't have to go away. They, they say you can't do anything. And it's like, it is really not true unless you let it get to you like that. And like, I have my spouse or whatever, like with all these like kind of wearies and stuff about myself, like said kind of the same thing to me with like, it doesn't have to change. And, and it really has it. It does, but it doesn't, it doesn't keep you from doing anything, but uh, it's a really nice moment with under pressure. Sucker right there. You got under this pressure is, playing. This has been a uh, Peter's parenting Right. Getting deep, man. When I feel blue. <laughs> when I feel blue. No. But no, this movie means a lot to me as it does you, and I get a lot from it. And it spoke to me at such a young age about like prophetic things in the future, which a lot of them hold true. It was like, I'm going to be really interested where I'm at when these things hit me. Technically, you're but that, older than these people, though. <laughs> I am now older than these people. I have a, like, this year was my 20-year anniversary of graduating high school, so I'm double. Did you Did you go? Did you bring the poem? No, it's delayed till next year. Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Of course, the, it's the yeah. we're, we're in the pandemic. You didn't do a virtual thing with 100 people on one screen? <laughs> Pass. And then all, outside of that, you have Joan Cusack, who's really great. But like, I feel like he just said, and just go. Just comedy do gold. your thing. Yeah. <laughs> just go with your thing. And I love her tone on the phone. I like how with with him, she's always like reserved, hesitant, but she will take it out on anybody else. And there's little cute moments where he goes in his office that's clearly she could talk to him through there and she has to wait. And, and he treats her well, well too. There's, there's her also money. that like undercurrent, the same with Alan Arkin, where it's, this guy could kill me. So like, I don't know how I'm supposed to proceed. Right. And then she has that going a little bit as far. Like even at the end when he says, you know, I'll, I'll come and you know, clear you out or whatever. She thinks, is, does that mean you're going to kill me? He's like, no, I've left a bunch of money for you. Like, there's just things like that, that kind of hint at like, he's a good guy, but these people that mm-hmm. are within his interest circle of trust, whatever you want to call it, don't necessarily know that they can't be afraid of him. Right. Yeah, Hank Azaria and K. Todd Friedman that are there like oh, all yeah. the time. That's right. The, the two the two guys, yeah, they are, they're hilarious. I mean, you could watch them for a movie. <laughs> that dynamic's yeah. fun, like what they're doing. And he- yeah, he's one of the um, lesser. I mean, he he went on to be a Buffy villain one season, yeah, but that's the main thing I know him as, right. <laughs> as far as that goes. Yeah, and obviously his area is doing his you know his thing, but it is still like a rare like he gets to have like a, a full on film role, and he's also like a key player and what have you. Hey, Debbie, uh, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm calling the show. I'm calling the show. and he calls into the radio. The whole. I mean, that radio, just to back up, that radio conversation that he has with Debbie, that's the most vulnerable he is in the entire movie. Like, that's the... Oh, yeah, vulnerable, it, like, spotlighted and getting shot and vulnerable to her and to yeah. a public. 
that's the most unc- like you know the killing and whatnot is like okay i have to do this that that's the scene where he has no control like he he has to manage his way out of this and it and he, and he basically loses <laughs> he doesn't come out successfully from that yeah when he almost spots hank azaria and they're like oh go 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 it feels real it feels like so this is what's happening like this is this is how the it really goes down rather than super cool dudes being mm. super slick all the time but it's kind of how it feels. All sorts of things. Like every, like we've been talking and just slobbering over this movie, just all around nails everything. I think people know about this movie, but I At I this still point, think I think it, it has that, like a big enough cult following where like offhand, you right. can be like, yeah, gross my play. I, I think High Fidelity still has like that yeah. higher appeal. High Fidelity is the pop, yeah, that's the popular one. It was a better one, review but... and a more, more prestigious film in all of these things. Stephen Frears, right. by the way. And it's still a good, uh, still, yeah. Yeah, still oh, yeah, a good it's movie, one, it's too. It's also yeah, one of my favorite movies, right. but... Um... <laughs> yeah, Cusack went on a great run here. He had this, Con Air, High Fidelity. He was, he was the man. And he's one of my favorite actors. And he's one of those actors that, like we said, you get Cusack. Like, he Cusacks up what he's doing. He'll be great in the role, but you gotta let him mold the character a bit. Which, yeah, it's just a genuine, awesome, good time. Every time I see it. And I've watched it, I don't know how many times, but... Yeah, so I, I I know I've seen it. I, it's at least fifty three years old. So yeah, that's. <laughs> What else? This is where we talk about anything else that's going on with us that we've seen, taken part in, or just want to share with a listening audience. Aaron, what have you partaken in or any pieces you've written, things you've watched? I mean, right, like currently right now, it's the week of the Toronto International Film Festival. So I've been getting to watch a lot of the films out of there and certainly some good ones. Uh, Nomadland is the new film from Chloe Zhao with uh, Francis Gorman. That's getting a lot of notice and it's quite good. I watched Pieces of a Woman with my lovely girlfriend. We watched that. Vanessa Kirby, who's from like Hobbs and Shaw and Mission Impossible Fallout. She's very good in it. And the like, there's an opening 26 minute tracking shot that follows her giving a home birth. That's very intense. It's, you know, it's a long unbroken shot that does this. It's her and Shia LaBeouf and Molly Parker. That stuff really works. I wish the movie was a little better. I don't want to get too far into how much I like these movies, but like there's some good stuff there. I right. saw a documentary called MLK slash FBI yesterday, which is about the FBI's attempts to basically, oh. to basically to bug set Martin up, Luther yeah. King and to set him up for things and do a lot of things that are very shady because that's how Hoover was. And that's what society looks like in that time and still now. But uh, yeah, no, I've been seeing a lot of a lot of different movies for the Toronto Film Festival. As far as things I've written, like I can mention the variety thing. I had an article with an interview with the director of Train to Basan Presents Peninsula, which I was very happy with. And coming at the time of this recording this week, I'll have an interview with the directors of Antebellum, Bush and Wrens, talking about the cinematography of that film. There's a cool like bit of information in there that I specifically focused on that I'm very happy with as far as something that connects that film to A Gone with the Wind, of all things. So yeah, just you know, doing that stuff. And, you know, just surviving through this whole pandemic thing, which basically means working and watching lots of movies and spending as plenty of time as I can with my girlfriend. We went miniature golfing as far as things that we're up to. We went miniature golfing last week, which was nice. I've been watching some Robert Zemeckis movies. I like the Blank Check podcast, and they're doing all Robert Zemeckis right now. So I've been slowly going through that uh, filmography because why not? Why not? You got time. I, I hadn't seen I Want to Hold Your Hand before. And you know what? That's a good movie. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Myself, I currently up at Weiser or Blue, I have a review of the 4K Ultra HD set for the Hitchcock Classics Collection, which is really awesome. And Vertigo is... Oh, are those good? Just, are those good movies? Oh, uh, eh, you know, they're watchable. But <laughs> <laughs> no, the the restoration on all of them are great. I want to single out Vertigo because it's one of the most stunning things on home video. I put a lot of time into that review for some reason. A lot of pressure with Hitchcock stuff. I want to put two song. Yes. <laughs> I want to uh, talk about this board game I played recently. I got it for my birthday, and I haven't opened it yet. And uh, I was home alone with my children on, uh, well, <laughs> being a father, <laughs> home alone with my children. This past weekend, I finally opened it up. It's called Horrified. You've probably seen it around. It's officially licensed Universal Monsters board game. Ooh. I thought I didn't have anyone to play with. It says ages 10 and up. But I was like, eh, my kids are smart, and they are. But I started playing that game, and I didn't realize everybody plays as a team Ooh. on that, so it's not against one another, so you play together. You can even play solo, but uh, you don't play all the monsters at once. You could. Uh, there's different variations, and super fun. I played it. We played it twice. My daughter, who's six, is in love with this game. She has to play it every night, but it takes about an hour to play by the time we're done with school and stuff they need to go to bed but this game's really fun it's complex but if you have someone who knows how to run it it's 
pretty fun. Are you trying to escape a castle or something like that, or is it? You're trying to kill them. You're trying to defeat the monsters. And so you're not you're not you're not playing as the monsters in a pandemic like game where you're trying to solve the world's diseases yet also being Frankenstein at the same time. Because I'd be interested in that. Not quite. You do get to be the monsters. So every time you take a turn, you're a hero. They're based off people from the movies, and the villagers are actual characters from the movies. They actually have Chick and what's his name from Abbott and Costello and Frankenstein. They're actually characters. So. You have to defeat the monsters. Each monster has a different way it moves around and to defeat it. And so you you go your turn as a hero, and then you go a turn as a monster. But but Blackula moves like he does. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Oh, that's for the video feed. Yeah, and there's villagers you got to save so the monsters don't kill them. There's items to pick up. It's really fun. It's a lot simpler than it sounds. That game's really awesome. I also want to point out that this week on uh, the feed, we're going to have the seven commentary we recorded for Out Now with Aaron and Abe. It's going to show up, and it's going to be October, Aaron, so you've already started it up, but the horror podcast that yeah. we do on Out Now will be coming out. Those won't be on this feed, but... I'm going to be sharing the hell out of them because they're some of the for most sure, fun yeah, I have through the year. Five years now, maybe? We've been doing these every October where we spend the entire month of October putting together bonus episodes themed around various subjects involving the horror genre. We have we did like the Decades in Horror for our first year, which was a lot of fun. We've talked about slasher movies. We've talked, we, you know, we've, done, we've, done, we've run the gamut on the different types of things that we can talk about concerning something specific for horror. Mm-hmm. Yet, there's still plenty of other things we can talk about. So we, uh, we had some cool plans on their way. And Aaron, one last time before we head out, where can we find all your beautiful stuff that you, we've been talking about? Well, everything I do ends up on my personal blog, thecodezeek.com, but I'm also writing uh, movie reviews over at weliveentertainment.com, which is where my TIFF coverage can be found as well. I also cover Blu-rays, Criterion Blu-rays specifically over at ysablu.com. I'm occasionally writing on Variety, and I'm on Twitter at Aaron's PS4. And you can find my written work at whysoblue.com. Uh, you can find more information on the show at the website. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Brandon4KUHD. Like, th- Thanks again, Aaron, for coming on. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so happy to be here on, on one of your inaugural episodes. I like to think that everyone can cool down after that ridiculous Scott Mendelson was on and can just bask in the glory of Brandon and I talking about something much more worthwhile than David Dobkin's Shanghai Nights, which I like quite a bit. I think it's very good <laughs> to talk about this. It's no gross point blank. It's no. I'll be back tomorrow with 4K Blues Day. Uh, until then, uh, just remember to keep the positivity in your online film chatter. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Alsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. Additional information on this and other episodes at thebrandonpetershow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at thebrandonpetershow.com. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found. 